Hi, boys and girls. Miss Melanie here, and I'm going to share with you today some fun African folktales that come from the west of Africa. Now, here's our globe. We live in Brownsville, Texas. We live in the continent of North America, in the country of the United States, in the state of Texas, and here at the Gladys Porter Zoo is Brownsville, Texas. Well, these stories are coming from Africa, which is all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And they come from countries right over here like Liberia and Guinea and a lot of little bitty, little bitty countries. Now, boys and girls, when people travel and they, or they move from place to place, sometimes they have lots of time. They have time to get all their stuff together and beep, 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 bap the truck up but sometimes they've had to leave in a hurry or not because they wanted to at all. And in that case, pe however people move from one place to another, they can always bring three things with them. They bring their language, they bring their music, and they bring their stories. And that is how stories like this one, why mosquitoes buzz in people's ears, got all the way over here to Texas. This is a West African tale. It's written by Verna Artema, and the pictures are by Leo and Diane Dillon. I love the artwork in this. So this is Why Mosquitoes Buzz in People's Ears. One morning, a mosquito saw an iguana drinking at a water hole. The mosquito said, Iguana, you will never believe what I saw yesterday. Try me, said the iguana. The mosquito said, I saw a farmer digging yams that were almost as big as I am. What's a mosquito compared to a yam? Snapped the iguana grumpily. I'd rather be deaf than listen to such nonsense. Hmm. Then he stuck two sticks in his ears and went off, mecca, 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 through the reeds. The iguana was still grumbling to himself when he happened to pass by a python. The big snake raised his head and said, Good morning, iguana. But the iguana did not answer, but lumbered on, bobbing his head, bobbing his head, bada bing, 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 bada bing, bing, bing. Well, why wouldn't he speak to me? said the python to himself. Iguana must be angry about something. I'm afraid he's plotting some mischief against me. He began looking for somewhere to hide. The first likely place he found was a rabbit hole, and in he went, wasa, wasu, wasa, wasu, wasa, wasu. When the rabbit saw the big snake coming into her burrow, she was terrified. Ah! She scurried out through the back way and bounded kitty, 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 across the clearing. A crow saw the rabbit running for her life. He flew into the forest crying, caw, caw, caw. It was his duty to spread the alarm in case of danger. A monkey heard the crow. He was sure that some dangerous beast was prowling nearby. So he began screeching and leaping killy willy through the trees to help warn all the other animals. As the monkey was crashing through the treetops, he happened to land on a dead limb and it broke and it fell on an owl's nest and it killed one of the little owlets. Mother Owl was not at home for though she usually hunted only in the night, this morning she was still out searching for one more little tidbit to satisfy her hungry babies. But when she returned to the nest, she found one of them was dead. Her other children told her that monkey killed it. And all that day and all that night, she sat in her tree, so sad, so sad, so sad. Now it was Mother Owl who woke the sun each day so that the dawn would come. But this time, when she should have hooted for the sun, she did not do it. The night grew longer and longer. The animals of the forest knew night was lasting much too long. They feared the sun would never come back. At last, King Lion called a meeting of the animals. They came and they sat down, pim, 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 around a huge council fire. Mother Owl did not come, so the antelope was sent to fetch her. When she arrived, King Lion said, Mother Owl, why have you not called the sun? The night has lasted too long, 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 and everyone is very worried. 
Mother Owl said, Monkey killed one of my owlets. Because of that, I cannot bear to wake up the sun. The king said to the gathered animals, Did you hear? It was the monkey who killed the owlet. And now Mother Owl won't wake the sun. So that day can come. Then King Lion called the monkey. He came before him very nervous, glancing around side to side. Rim, 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 rim. Monkey, said the king, why did you kill one of the mother owl's babies? Oh, king, said the monkey, it was the crow's fault. See, he was calling and calling to warn us of danger, and, and I went leaping through the trees to help. Well, then a limb broke, and, and it broke out under me, and it fell, oh, boom, on the owl's nest. The king said to the council, Aha! So it was the crow who alarmed the monkey who killed the owlet. And now Mother Owl won't wake the sun so that day can come. Then the king called to the crow. The big bird came flapping up. He said, King Lion, it was the rabbit's fault. I saw her running for her life in the daytime. What, wasn't that just reason enough to, to spread the alarm? The king nodded his head and said to the council, So, it was the rabbit who startled the crow, who alarmed the monkey, who killed the owlet, and now Mother Owl won't wake the sun so that day can come. Then King Lion called to the rabbit. The timid little creature stood before him, trembling, one trembling paw drawn up uncertainly. Rabbit, cried the king, why did you break a law of nature and go running, 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 running in the daytime? Oh, king, said the rabbit, it was the python's fault. I was in my house minding my own business when that big snake came in and chased me out. Hmm, the king said to the council. So, it was the python who scared the rabbit, who startled the crow, who alarmed the monkey, who killed the owlet, and now... Mother Owl won't wake the sun so that day can come. King Lion called the python, who came slithering wassaw wassu, wassaw wassu, past the other animals. But King, he cried, it wasn't my fault, it was Iguana's fault. He wouldn't speak to me, and, and I thought he was plotting some mischief against me. So when I crawled into the rabbit hole, I was just trying to hide. The king said to the council, So, it was the iguana who frightened the python, who scared the rabbit, who startled the crow, who alarmed the monkey, who killed the owlet, and now Mother Owl won't wake the sun. Hmm? So the day can come. Now the iguana was not at the meeting, for he had not heard the summons. Remember, he put sticks in his ears. The antelope was sent to fetch him. All the animals laughed <laughs> when they saw the iguana coming. Bada mean, bada mean, bada mean, bada mean, with the sticks still stuck in his ears. King Mayan pulled out the sticks. <laughs> then he asked, Iguana, what evil have you been plotting against Python? No, not at all, cried the iguana. Python's my friend. Then why wouldn't you say good morning to me? Demand, demanded the snake. Well, I didn't even hear you, or and I didn't see you, said Iguana. Mosquito told me such a big lie, I couldn't bear to listen to it, so I put sticks in my ears. Oh, nyah, 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 said the lion. So that is why you had sticks in your ears. Yes, said Iguana. It was the mosquito's fault. King Lion said to the council, mm -hmm. So, it was the mosquito who annoyed the Iguana, who frightened the python, who scared the rabbit, who startled the crow, who alarmed the monkey, who killed the owlet, and now Mother Owl won't wake the sun so that day can come. Punish the mosquito! Punish the mosquito! cried all the animals. When Mother Owl heard that, though, she was satisfied. She turned her head towards the east and she hooted, hoo hoo hoo! Hoo hoo hoo! Hoo, hoo, hoo. And then the sun came up. Meanwhile, the mosquito had listened to it all from a nearby bush. She crept under a curly leaf. Salmon was never found and brought before the council. But because of this, the mosquito has a guilty conscience 
And to this day, she goes about whining and whining in people's ears. Is everyone still angry with me? And when she does that, she gets an honest answer. Whack! Kapow! And that is why mosquitoes buzz in people's ears. Hello there, my name is Richard. I am the program animal keeper here at the Gladys Porter Zoo. And this is one of our animal ambassadors, Iris. She is a Virginia opossum. Virginia opossums can actually be found all throughout the United States, from the Rocky Mountains all the way to the West Coast. You can find them in Mexico, but you could even find them in Canada. These guys, they're very, very interesting creatures because they eat almost everything. They love to eat fruits, they love to eat veggies, They'll eat small bugs and even small animals as well. The Virginia opossum is actually North America's only marsupial. And what that means is that she carries her babies around in a pouch. She is also a mammal, which means that she produces milk, she has fur, and she's also a warm-blooded creature. Some interesting facts about the Virginia opossum is that they're actually a nocturnal animal. So these animals are mainly only gonna be out hunting at night. So they're just out looking for food, for water, and for shelter. Virginia opossums don't have the best eyesight in the world. So they rely on their whiskers to actually feel everything that's around them. Virginia opossums are also very, very good at climbing because they have opposable thumbs also, they have a prehensile tail, which allows them to grip onto stuff. Virginia opossums have been given a little bit of a bad reputation down here in the valley because a lot of people say that they carry a lot of diseases, that they're very dirty animals, and that's actually not true. Iris here is very, very clean. She spends most of her day just grooming herself and grooming everybody else around her if she can. But one thing that's very, very interesting, a lot of people hear that opossums carry rabies, and it's actually untrue. Opossums are incapable of carrying the rabies virus in their body just due to their low body temperature. Thank you for hanging out with me and Iris. Now to get back to some of your wild tales. The next story we're gonna hear is one of my old favorites, tried and true, two ways to count to 10. And this one is a Liberian folk tale, retold by Ruby D. Now what that means is she didn't make up the story, she heard it and heard it and heard it, and so she's just retelling it. You know, when we hear stories from other lands too, it's interesting because somebody tells it and then somebody else tells it and they might add a little bit or take a little bit away and, and then they tell somebody else and then they might add a little piece and take something else away. So sometimes a story can go all the way around the world and be a little bit different everywhere you hear it. This is Two Ways to Count to Ten and it's illustrated by Susan Mehta. <clears throat> long, long ago, Animals were not so different one from the other. They were different colors, shapes, and sizes, just as they are today, but they lived together in friendship and in peace. The leopard was king, rich beyond telling, mighty in his power and his wisdom. All the animals respected and loved their king. Who shall I name to rule after me when I die? King Leopard said one day to his beloved daughter, I must seek out the cleverest beast in our jungle. I must find one who is wise enough to rule well. I shall make him a prince. And someday, my dear daughter, the two of you shall be king and queen. Kissy, kissy. King Leopard was pleased with his idea and he planned a great feast. His royal drums carried the news of the feast far and wide throughout the jungle. All the animals came as guests and they danced and they danced for three whole days. They're all getting down there, even the, even the giraffe and the lion and the monkey. At last, the king told them to make a huge circle. Stepping into the center, he called his daughter to his side. And then he spoke in a loud voice. 
Listen, my friends, he cried. Someday, when I am gone, another king must rule in my place. I will choose him now from among one of you, so that he will be ready. There was a murmur of excitement all through the crowd. I wonder who it is. I don't know. Did you know? I don't know. About that. I shall seek the cleverest one among you, for your king must be wise. He shall be a son to me and a husband to my dear daughter. He shall share all of my riches. Shouts came from the eager guests at the king's feast. No doubt each animal hoped that the good fortune would be his. Then King Le Leopard held up his hunting spear. Look, look at this, my people, and watch. He flung the spear far up into the air, and then he caught it when it fell to earth again. Shoom. With this spear, I will test you. I will test you. He would be our prince, must also be able to throw the spear towards the sky. He must send it so high that he can count to 10 before it comes back down again. There was a buzz of talk among all the animals. Do you think you're gonna, I don't think that's very hard. I don't know, but what do you think? I don't know. This would not be so hard to do. One after another, they came forward to try their skill. But first, each beast danced and sang before the king and his daughter. I'll be first, said the elephant, pushing all the other beasts out of the way. The elephant danced very clumsily. He was very big and his body was very heavy. With his trunk in the air, he trumpeted all the fine deeds that he would perform if he were king. I will be king. I can do these things, he said. And with his trunk, the great beast threw King Leopard's spear up into the air. One, two, three, he began counting. But before the elephant had even said four, the king's spear dropped back to the earth. The proud beast hung his head so low that the tip of his trunk dragged on the ground. He had failed. Next came Bush Ox. I will be king. I can do this thing, said the huge animal as he danced. I can throw that spear all the way to the sun. So the bush ox picked up the spear in his mouth and with a mighty, mighty toss of his great head, he flung it far, far above his wide gray horns. One, two, three, four, the bush ox counted. But he too was slow. Before he could say five, the spear was back on the ground and he went off ashamed back into the jungle. The chimpanzee was third. He jumped up and down and beat his hairy chest with his fist, singing how much he would like to be king. The chimpanzee rose up on his hind legs and held the spear in one hand, just like a man. I, 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 I will be king. I, 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 I can do this thing, he said. And with the twist of his long arm, he threw that spear towards the sky. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He chattered as fast as he could. The animals held their breath. Surely with such a quick tongue, he could make the count. But shoom, he did not. Just as he said eight, the spear fell back into his hand. Then the crowd parted as the lion stepped majestically into the center of the circle. The lion had always wanted to be king anyway, and now was his chance to prove that he, he was the finest animal in all of the jungle. With the fling of his mighty mane, he danced and sang of his royal intentions. I will be king. <laughs> I can do this thing, he sang. And as the other animals looked on in awe, the lion twirled his tail around the spear and he threw it skyward with a thunderous roar. One, two, three, four. The spear rose higher and higher. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. But just as he said nine, the spear pierced the earth at his feet. Well, the lion was furious and off he stamped back into the bushes. One by one, all of the other animals tried to count to ten while the spear was still in the air. 
but one by one, they all failed. It seems I must look somewhere else for a beast who is clever enough to rule when I am gone, King Leopard said very sadly. Let me throw your spear, O oh king, came a brave voice from the crowd and out stepped the slender antelope. I would very much love to marry your beautiful daughter. I will be king. I, I can do this thing. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> the other animals broke into laughter. How could this weak and puny creature possibly throw the king's spear high enough to count to more than two or three? Ha! How could he hope to succeed where all of the other animals, even the lion, had failed? But the young antelope would not be turned aside. Please, I wish to try, he insisted. So King Leopard nodded his head. Who can say what any creature can do until he has tried? The king said to the crowd, the antelope may throw the spear. So the other animals moved back to give him room. And when the antelope danced, ooh, King Leopard's daughter was very pleased. No one could deny that his steps were more graceful than all the other animals' steps. And with a toss of his head, he flung that spear far up into the air. And before it could fall back to earth, he called out these five words. Two, four, six, eight, ten, he cried. There, you see, I have counted to ten. King Leopard did not say how the count was to be made. The king laughed ha, 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 and nodded his royal head. That is right. No, I did not say how the count had to be made. He agreed. And as everyone knows, one can count to ten by twos just as well as by ones. Remember, my friends, it is not always the biggest or the strongest, but sometimes the cleverest one that wins the prize. The antelope has won my contest. He shall be king. At the wedding feast, which King Leopard gave for his daughter, the animals all cheered their clever new prince. And that is two ways to count to ten. Of all the seven different kinds of spider monkeys found in the world, two kinds can be found here at the Gladys Porter Zoo, the Mexican spider monkey and the black spider monkey. You can usually see them using their limbs and tails to show off their acrobatic skills. Spider monkeys are arboreal mammals, which means they spend most of their time in trees. These monkeys get their name because they use their long limbs and tails to hold on to different branches, which makes them look like a spider. They have hook-like hands with long fingers and their elongated arms allow them to move through the trees using a hand-over-hand -hand motion called brachiation. What makes them unique is that on each hand, they only have four fingers and no opposable thumb. They also have a prehensile tail. A prehensile tail is a tail of an animal that has adapted to be able to grasp or hold objects. Spider monkeys are well recognized because of their tail. It's like an extra hand. They use it to hold and manipulate objects. It also helps them to move in trees to find food. The underside of the tail is tough. It does not have any hair. At the tip of the tail, there is a patch of skin with a fingerprint-like pattern, which resembles a human fingerprint. At the Gladys Porter Zoo, each troop, that's what a group of spider monkeys is called, lives on their own island. The troop of Mexican spider monkeys consists of four monkeys, Paco, Galena, Cookie, and the baby of the group, Chloe. The troop is outgoing and responds well to the keepers and enjoys receiving special treats, with the exception of Cookie, who tends to keep to herself. Five monkeys call the Black Spider Monkey Island their home. Old Timer is the oldest female on the island. Duke and Robin are parents to Bobby and Christopher, the youngsters of the troop. All of them are very outgoing except for Robin, who's shy. These two troops will communicate with one another whether it be with actions or noises, which is pretty cool to watch.
Tripping Chicken by David and Zarstein. It was bedtime for the little red chicken. Okay, my little chicken, said Papa. Are you all ready to go to sleep? Yes, Papa, but you forgot something. What's that, asked Papa? A bedtime story. All right, said Papa. I'll read you one of your favorites. And of course, you're not going to interrupt the story tonight, are you? Oh, no, Papa. I'll be good. Hansel and Riedel. Hansel and Riedel were very hungry. Deep in the woods, they found a house made of candy. Nibble, nibble, nibble. They began to eat the house until an old woman who lived there came out and said, What little children? Why did you come inside? The witch was about to fall on her. When? Out of the little red chicken. And she said, Don't go away. She's a witch. So Hansel and Gretel did it. The end. Chicken? Yes, Papa? You interrupted the story. Try not to get so involved. I'm sorry, Papa. But she was, really was a witch. Well, you're supposed to be relaxing so you can fall asleep. Let's try another story. I'll be good. Little Red Riding Hood. Take this basket of goodies to Grandma, said Little Red Riding Hood's mother. But don't stray from the past. The woods are full of danger. Red Riding Hood skipped along through the woods. By then she met a wolf who wished her good morning. She was about to answer him when... Out jumped a little red chicken. She said, don't talk to strangers. So Little Red Riding Hood did it. The end. <clears throat> chicken? Yes, Papa? You did it again. You interrupted the story. And you're not even sleepy. I know, Papa. I'm sorry, but he was a mean old wolf. Now. Yes. Now. Get back into bed. Okay, Papa. Let's try one more little story. And I'll be good. Chicken Little. Chicken Little was hit on the head by an acorn. The sky is falling, she thought. She was about to run off and warn Goosey Lucy, Ducky Lucky, Henny Penny, and everyone on the farm. The sky was falling when I'll jump the a uh, little red chicken. She said, Don't panic. It was just an acorn. So Chicken Little did it. The end. <coughs> Chicken? Yes, Papa? You did it again. Oh, Papa, I can't let the little chicken get all, all upset over an acorn. But please read one more story to me. And I promise I'll fall But chicken and chicken, said Papa. We are out of stories. Oh no, Papa, I can't really think without a story. Then, said Papa yawning, why don't you tell me the story? Me tell a story, said the little red chicken. Okay, Papa. Here we go. Um. Bedtime for Papa by Chicken. Once there was a little red chicken who put her Papa to bed. She read him a hundred stories. She even gave him warm milk, but nothing worked. He stayed wide awake. All. Papa? Good night, Papa. The Well, that was Interrupting Chicken by David and Christine. I hope you enjoy that and one more. I'm going to try one more time. Wait. There we go. Hope you enjoy, and till next time. Hi everybody, I am Parker Coppins from Disney XD's Parker Plays, and I'm here to read you a book called Giraffes Can't Dance. Shall we begin? <clears throat> Giraffes Can't Dance by Giles Andrea. Gerald was a tall giraffe whose neck was long and slim, but his knees were awfully crooked and his legs were rather thin. He's a cute little guy, it's like me. Long necks, little tiny toes, <laughs> little skinny legs. Oh, he's so cute. He was very good at standing still and munching shoots off trees, but when he tried to run around, he buckled at the knees. 
Looks like me running, running as well. Now every year in Africa, they hold the jungle dance, where every single animal turns up to skip and prance. And this year, when the day arrived, poor Gerald felt so sad, because when it came to dancing, he was really very bad. Oh, the jungle dance. Even hyenas are in there. Oh, little guys. Can you see where the little lion is? He's got a rose in his mouth and everything. The warthog started waltzing. The rhinos rock and rolled. The lions danced to tango. That was elegant and bold. Ra -da -dia -pa. <laughs> Cute. The chimps did the cha-cha with a very Latin feel, and eight baboons then teamed up for a splendid Scottish reel. <laughs> Gerald swallowed bravely as he walked towards the floor, but the lions saw him coming, and they soon began to roar. Hey, look at that clumsy Gerald. The animals all sneered. Giraffes can dance, you silly fool. Oh, Gerald, you're so weird. Oh, poor little Gerald. Gerald simply froze up. He was rooted on the spot. They're right, he thought. I'm useless. Ugh, I feel like such a clot. So he crept off from the dance floor and he started walking home. He'd never felt so sad before. So sad and so alone. Poor Gerald. Aww. Then he found a little clearing and he looked up at the sky. The moon can be so beautiful, he whispered with a sigh. Excuse me, coughed a cricket who'd seen Gerald earlier on. But sometimes when you're different, you just need a different song. <laughs> Aww. Listen to the swaying grass and listen to the trees. To me, the sweetest music is those branches in the breeze. So imagine that the lovely moon is playing just for you. Everything makes music if you really want it to. What a smart little cricket. And he plays music too, I'm assuming. With that, the cricket smiled and picked up his violin. Then Gerald felt his body do the most amazing thing. His hooves had started shuffling, making circles on the ground. His neck was gently swaying and his tail was swooshing around. <laughs> He threw his legs out sideways and he swung them everywhere. Then he did a backward somersault and leapt up in the air. Look at him go. <laughs> I love it. Gerald felt so wonderful with his mouth open wide. I'm dancing, yes, I'm dancing, I'm dancing, Gerald cried. Then one by one, each animal who'd been there at the dance arrived while Gerald boogied on and watched him quite entranced. They shouted, it's a miracle, we must be in a dream. Gerald's the best dancer that we've ever seen. How'd you learn how to dance like that? Please, Gerald, show us how. But Gerald simply twirled around and finished with a bow. Then he raised his head and looked up at the moon and stars above. We all can dance, he said, when we find the music we love. That's so cute. What a nice little book. It's about being yourself and being weird. <laughs> everybody needs to be weird. Finding that music that fits you, you know? All right, send in love, everybody. Hopefully you have a great one. See you guys.
Hello, everybody. My name is Ray Banda. I am so excited to be here so I can read my book to you. The book I'm reading today is Bean Saves the Day, which is actually the sequel to Bean's New Home. And this one is actually based on a true story, How I Rescued My Cat back in 2010. But who's excited about this story? I am. I'm excited to read it to you guys. All right, let's go ahead and start reading this. Bean Saves a Day by Ray Bond, illustrated by Chris Sweet. This is Bean. Little Bean is a special cat who was once rescued as a tiny kitten. Bean had trouble walking and keeping his balance as a kitten, but made huge improvements thanks to his new owners, Ryan and Kate, his adoptive mother, Francesca, and his adopted sister, Petunia. One day, Ryan and Kate brought home a new member to the family, a boxer puppy named Hercules. Even though Bean was curious to see this new member of the family, he was still a little scared to approach him. He found it easier to observe him from a distance. After a few days passed, Bean saw that Hercules was a friend. The pets would all play together. During thunderstorms, the pets would get frightened. Bean would always hide under a bed or a sofa, while Francesca and Petunia would usually run to the garage. Hercules often stayed under the table, whimpering the whole time. However, once the storm passed, the pets would come up from hiding and play together like nothing happened. That was one scary storm, Francesca said. Yes, but now we can all play together, Petunia happily told her. One evening, a massive storm was passing by. As usual, the pets ran to their hiding spots. Oh no, not again, Bean said as he hit under the sofa. The storm knocked out the power. Ryan and Kate used flashlights and lit a few candles in the kitchen. They also opened a few windows. Ryan and Kate had to eat dinner in the dark. Well, at least we can have a candlelit dinner, Ryan joked to Kate. At bedtime, the storm was still roaring loudly. Kate snuffed the flame on the candle she had lit. Ryan went to the sofa Bean was under. It's okay, Bean, he said. The storm will pass. Good night. I'm so scared, Bean thought as he shivered with fear. Throughout the night, the thunder was still coming loud and the wind was very strong. One of the wind gusts was so strong that it blew into the kitchen window and knocked over a forgotten candle on the kitchen table. The falling candle caused the nearby curtains to catch on fire. The burning curtain immediately caught Bean's attention. Luckily, Hercules was not hiding under the table at the time. Realizing that something must be done, Bean cautiously walked out from under the sofa. Just then, there was a loud clap of thunder. Bean ran back to hiding. This is so scary, Bean said. Bean looked at the kitchen again and saw that the glow of the fire was getting brighter. He was too scared to do anything, though. The seconds seemed like hours to Bean, and his fear grew more with each passing second. With a sudden burst of courage, Bean faced his fears and ran from under the sofa. I can do this, he said. Boom! Another loud clap of thunder was heard. Shivering with fear, Bean stayed still this time and did not run back under the sofa. Bean closed his eyes for a few seconds, then ran toward Ryan and Kate's room. I can do this, he said as he ran. Despite the loud thunder, Ryan and Kate were sound asleep. Hercules was also sound asleep under their bed. Bean jumped on the bed and pawed at Ryan's nose to wake him. After a few attempts, Ryan woke up. As Ryan woke up, he smelled the smoke and saw a faint glow coming from the kitchen. Kate, wake up, 
It's a fire somewhere in the house. He shot it, he jumped out of bed. Ryan ran toward the kitchen and saw the curtains engulfed in flames. He grabbed a nearby fire extinguisher and put out the fire. Ryan then saw the fallen candle. Looks like we forgot to snuff out the candle. Ryan said to Kate. Looks like our smoke detector battery needed to be replaced too. Ryan sighed as she inspected the smoke detector. Ryan then saw Bean looking at the kitchen from the distance. He walked over to him and picked him up. You saved the day, Bean. I once saved you, and now you saved us. The storm then passed and the power came back on. The pets came out from hiding. They all gathered around Bean, praising him for his heroic deed. You're a hero, Bean, Petunia said. Little Bean was so happy to be loved by his adopted family. The end. And as another note, my story is actually based on my pets. Here's my cat, Bean. Mr. Bean, actually. There's Francesca, and there's Hercules over here, and there's Petunia. So I really hope you all enjoyed the story. So I hope you all take care, stay safe, and keep on reading. Bye. Hi, my name is Christian Garcia and I'm the general manager at Raising Canes on Boca Chica. We are excited to hear that the Gladys Porter Zoo is encouraging young children to read, so we decided to help them out by donating 100 bookmark awards. With these bookmark awards, children can redeem a free kids meal at any Raising Canes. The first 100 children to visit the zoo starting today will receive one. All they have to do is ask for a bookmark at the gate. Child must be present and only one ticket per child. Thanks for watching. Our next story is Anansi and the Moss-Covered Rock, retold by Eric Kimmel, and it's illustrated by Janet Stevens. This is another story that's from West Africa. Now, Anansi is a character that shows up a lot in stories in West Africa, in the West Indies, in Jamaica, and it made its way all the way to New Orleans and the South. How did it travel there? by people retelling and retelling and retelling the story. That's why it says retold by Eric Kimmel. He didn't make it up, he heard the story and decided to share it in a book. And Janet St Stevens does a wonderful job with their illustrations. So here we go, Anansi and the Moss Covered Rock. Once upon a time, Anansi the spider was walking, walking, walking through the forest when something caught his eye. It was a strange moss-covered rock. How interesting, Anansi said. Hmm, isn't this a strange moss-covered rock? Kaboom! Everything went black. Down fell Anansi, senseless. An hour later, Anansi woke up and his head was spinning around and around and around. And he wondered what had happened. I was just walking along this path when something caught my eye and I stopped and I said, isn't this a strange moss covered rock? <gasps> Kaboom! Down fell Anansi again. But this time when he woke up an hour later, he knew what was happening. Aha, said Anansi, this is a magic rock. And whenever anyone comes along and says those magic words, isn't this a strange, mm -hmm, down he goes. Ha! This is a good thing to know, said Anansi, and I know just how I'm going to use it. So Anansi went walking, walking, walking through the forest until he came to Lion's house. Lion was sitting on his porch and at his feet was a great big pile of yams. Well, Anansi loved yams, but he was too lazy to go dig them up himself. So Anansi said to Lion, hello, Lion. It's so hot today, don't you think? Oh yes, Anansi, it's so hot, said Lion. It is terribly hot. Well, I'm going to go for a walk in the cool forest, said Anansi. Would you like to come? Oh yes, I would. Thank you, said Lion. So Lion and Anansi went walking, 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 walking through the forest. And after a while, Anansi led Lion to a certain place. Lion, look, do you see what I see? Oh yes, Anansi, I do, said Lion. Hmm, isn't that a strange moss-covered rock? Kaboom! Down fell Lion. 
when a Nazi ran back to Lion's house and he made off with all of Lion's yams. An hour later, Lion woke up and his head was spinning around and around and around. A Nazi was nowhere in sight. And when Lion got home, he saw that every single one of his yams was gone. He was very sad. But Anansi was so happy, he couldn't wait to play his trick again. So once more, Anansi went walking, walking, walking through the forest. And this time he stopped at Elephant's house. Elephant was sitting on his porch, and at Elephant's feet was a great big pile of bananas. Oh, Anansi loved bananas, but he was much too lazy to pick them himself. So he said to Elephant, Guess what, Elephant? Isn't it hot today? Oh, it is. It's so hot, Elephant agreed. Well, I'm going to go for a walk in the cool forest, said Anansi. Would you like to come? Oh, yes, that sounds so nice, said Elephant. Please, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So Anansi and Elephant went walking, walking, walking through the forest. And after a while, Anansi led Elephant to a certain place. Elephant, look, do you see what I see? Elephant looked and said, why, yes, I do, Anansi. Isn't that a strange moss-covered rock? Kaboom! Down fell Elephant. Well, Anansi ran back to Elephant's house and made off with all of the bananas. An hour later, an Elephant woke up. His head was spinning around and around and around. Anansi was nowhere in sight. And when he got home, he found out that every single one of his bananas was gone. Well, Elephant was very sad. But Anansi was so happy! He couldn't wait to play his trick again. He played it on rhinoceros and hippopotamus. He played it on giraffe and even zebra. He played it on every single animal in the forest. Now, all this time, watching from behind the leaves was Little Bush Deer. Now, Little Bush Deer was very small and very shy and very hard to see. She watched Anansi play his wicked trick again and again on all the other animals. And Little Bush Deer decided it was time for Anansi, Anansi to learn a lesson. So Little Bush Deer went deep into the forest to where coconut trees grow. She climbed up a coconut tree and threw down so many coconuts. She carried the coconuts home in a basket and set them on her porch. And then she sat down beside them and waited. And in a little while, along came Anansi again. Well, Anansi's eyes lit up when he saw those coconuts. Anansi loved coconuts. He loved to eat the tender white coconut meat and glug, 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 drink that sweet coconut milk inside. But he was much too lazy to gather them himself. So instead, he said, Hello, little bush deer. It's so hot today. Little bush deer smiled and said, Mm-hmm, yes, it's very hot, Anansi. Well, I'm going for a walk in the cool forest. Would you like to come? Yes, I believe I would, said Little Bush Deer. So Anansi and Little Bush Deer went walking, walking, walking into the cool forest. And after a while, Anansi led Little Bush Deer to a certain place. Little Bush Deer, look, come, come, look over there. Do you see what I see? Now remember, Little Bush Deer knew all about Anansi's tricks. So she looked and she said, no, Anansi, I don't see anything. Oh, come on, you must see it. Look right there. Look very carefully. Little Bush Deer looked. Mm, no, I still don't see anything. Well, Anansi got angry. You must see it. Look, look, look right where I'm standing. Now look where I am pointing. Do you see it now? No, Anansi, I don't see anything. Anansi stamped his legs. You see it. You just don't want to say it. Say what? Asked Little Bush Deer. You know. Oh, is that what I'm supposed to say? Yes, said Anansi. Well, all right, all right. I will say it to make you happy. Ready? <clears throat> you know, said Little Bush Deer. There, see, I said it. Aren't you satisfied now? No, 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 shouted Anansi. You are not supposed to say, you know. Well, what am I supposed to say? Asked Little Bush Deer. <sighs> you are supposed to say, isn't this a strange moss-covered rock? <gasps> Kaboom! Down fell Anansi. Little Bush Deer ran and got all the other animals, and together they went to Anansi's house and took back all the good things he had stolen from them. An hour later, Anansi woke up. His head was spinning around and around, and Little Bush Deer was nowhere in sight. 
And when he got home, he found his house as empty as it was before. But if you think Anansi learned his lesson, huh, you're mistaken, because he's still playing tricks to this very day. And that is Anansi and the Moss-Covered Rock.